All right. All right. Welcome back to the Shop Class Podcast. Tonight we got a big group with us. The community keeps growing. It's it's awesome. I love sharing ideas with other shop teachers and tradespeople uh, and engineers to find out the latest and greatest best practices, recommendations, storytelling, and really the camaraderie. So we're really it's really doing a good job here. I think I want to thank everybody, especially here tonight. Like everybody's sort of reaching out and bringing people in, and it's pretty cool. So uh, let me just go around. Um, and we got uh, uh, Brant Taylor's in the house. All right. If Actually, if I call out your name, just say hello so the sound moves over there, and then it will pull you up on the screen. So well, say I hello, Brant. I've got a talk in order to be seen. Very good. Well, good evening, everybody. Hack the planet. Yep. And we got Duke in the house. He's coming to us from outer space. Outer space, yeah. Normally East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Messing right. around with the uh, settings tonight. Nice. And we, oh, because of the three dots on the Google thing. And we got Nick. Nick is usually frozen, but tonight he's actually moving around. <laughs> or he's frozen right now. Okay. <laughs> I'm on my end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my computer's frozen. There you Can go. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. Jay Abitz is back. He was on an episode with us about his auto auto shop as basically a, a shop teacher. And uh, he actually won one of the Harbor Freight Awards. So we're going to find out what that was like and uh, what he plans on, how he plans on upgrading the shop, what he's going to do. Spending money, man. Nice. Good. And we got Matt. Bloomquist, he's here. He's a uh, he's a shop teacher that builds houses like on the actual site with the students. Like, forget school; they just bring the kids to the job site. So we're gonna get an update tonight, right, Matt? Yeah, yeah. What better class than that, right? Tell me about it. Winston <laughs> Davis, I think, se stepped away from the screen for a minute, but we're looking at, I guess, would be Freddy Krueger's basement or something. I don't know. <laughs> All right, how you doing, Winston? <clears throat> all right he's got to unmute to say hi i'm good good okay and he's still work though still work i wish i was uh you know at home drinking a beer all right and he's kind of cutting out a little bit there but um he's coming to us from alaska from wrangle and then tonight's guest mike can you hear us I can hear yes. you now. All right. Hey, turn your screen uh, horizontal. Okay. Yeah. And that always works out a lot better. It's a lot clearer. Uh, Mike, okay. coming to us from Alaska as well. You are the featured guest tonight. Well, I'm honored to be here. All right. My, uh, Mike, we're going to get into your, uh, you know, talking to you about your experiences as a contractor and your new shop, your shop, uh, po your podcast about contracting called uh, the contracting handbook. Um, but I got to tell you, I just briefly, I jumped on and I listened to two episodes. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Thank I really appreciate that. Yeah, really good. Uh, you know, kind of like it's different from this podcast. It's more about, I feel like it's best practices drilling down into what is the contracting business for a small business owner. Um, and so I really, I think that's a pretty cool topic to get into. So we, we'll get right into, and then we got Brant Taylor working on a similar situation and Matt was a contractor. So this is the group right here. This is a good group. All right. Um, all right. So let's start off, Matt. Um, you want to give us an update on your house? Yeah, I'll try to screenshot or screenshots. I'll try oh, to you... share my screen real quick. Okay. I could. Or... Let me, let me stop and let you do that. Okay. Okay, go for it. All right, let's see if I can. I, I put it on some Google Slides here real quick, so. Oh, nice. Yeah, so, you know, those who are tuning into this podcast, I don't remember if I said it before we started filming or after, but to me this is amazing to watch because I've never done anything like this. I'm like a car guy, and I to me it's amazing. They're literally starting with like a, a hole in the ground, and then there's like a building. Like, I don't know. That seems silly to maybe someone who's done it a million times. But to me, it's like amazing. I, that means for me as a 
possible home buyer, I don't have to buy a hundred year old crappy building and then spend the next 10, 20 years trying to fix it. I could actually start from scratch and I could see the process. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I mean, obviously everyone has their own uh, battles they want to pick, whether it's building new or, you know, taking on the hundred year old house, which there's definitely some merit in doing that as well too. Um, but for us, uh, what we've been doing is, um, it's a program we've had since back in 69. Uh, we had to do a relaunch in 2009 or in 2019 um, after it gotten put on pause for a few years due to some Illinois uh, budget issues and whatnot, politics, of course. Um, but anyways, we're back and running. We, we kept her going through COVID. So that's awesome. So we, we sold the house 28 or sorry, house 27. So what we're looking at right here is house 28. So yeah, just uh you know, a few months ago when school started. So two, yeah, three months ago, August, whatever, uh, beginning September ish, uh, we're digging a hole. Um, Tommy down there holding the, uh, story pole down there is, uh, a former student. He was a 2020 grad. So he's in the trades. Um, pretty much what we were doing was working on foundation. Now, one of the big things we do uh, is we've started, uh, I really tied into the building science community. That's how me and Brant have gotten to know each other and got connected so well. And uh, that community is, is a very generous community with their knowledge and uh, their networking. And so what we're looking at here is the underneath of our slab in our crawl space uh, has rock wool um, comfort board there. Um that rock will actually donated to the program. Um, thanks to Dan Edelman. Um, he's another good friend and big supporter. Uh, but anyways, we, we started trying to, you know, build better houses to use less energy. Um, kind of each year as I learn more and more and get more comfortable with details and understanding things, I try to take it to the next level, you know, as far as, you know, going from just, you know, air sealing and better insulation to, um, you, you know, ultimately, I would love to have the word passive tied to our house eventually one day. Um, and now, you know, and obviously a big push for, you know, the redu reducing the carbon footprint. Um, obviously, you know, some of these pictures are going to look, you're going to see some more concrete, uh, which doesn't really help in that factor. But it's one of those things where uh, we kind of went with a concrete um, foundation this time because we have an issue where we don't build as fast as everyone else. And so we stay exposed a really long time. And this year it happened to us again, just like the last house. Um, and when we have all wood framing, we run into mold issues because we have a closed off uh, crawl space. We, we encapsulate and everything. But until we get that completely encapsulated and dried out, it just gets pounded and pounded with water being fall season in Midwest. And so we went this route, which is something Jake Bruton and Steve Basic have done before. Um, we we kind of we we took a well, actually Steve provided the floor plans for us uh, for this house, and he's helped out um, from the last house to this house. He's I mean he's been actually helping us out from the start. Um, I'm very fortunate to get connected with him right away. Same with Drake, Jake. Um, so that's kind of why we went with uh, this unique looking foundation that's not very typical, where we have a slab cross space com combination so it's a it's a hybrid foundation so of oh, course you wait go Matt, ahead, let John. me just ask a question because i'm like clueless so this is not normal <laughs> so I, I wouldn't it's not know. it's not typical um it, i i've seen basements that have basements and a crawl space uh you don't often see a slab i mean you may see a slab butted up into a, to a, to a basement where, it all, but it all kind of connects together because our crawl space, actually we count the crawl space inside of our house. So we just Which say the, the crawl, crawl space, space is a short is basement. The, is, is it a, a pan decking? Say that. I'm sorry. Is it a pan decking? The, the, this lab over the crawl space? I'm, I don't think I'm familiar with that term, Mike. Uh, like, what's it poured on? So, the, the the crawl space was uh five foot tall walls mm -hmm. um on footings like kind of like a conventional base well for us conventional basement mm -hmm. um and then we have the uh um i guess uh trench footings going all the way around for the slab on the sides um 
and and then with um and then that top was poured so the top is one whole slab that all can, ties into the top of those walls I, I don't know what but there's a crawl space under that slab no there's nothing underneath the slab oh. so so what you're looking at here in the middle is the crawl space that opening what looks like a oh, indoor guess, swimming pool <laughs> i guess i can't see it that well can Max, i say you on your phone it? hey gotcha gotcha i misunderstood Gotcha. And, and, and as I get and I, on my Instagram post, I'll explain about this a little bit more explanation. Mm. Everybody, everybody that drove by, I always came by and was like, are you guys building like an in-ground pool or a really small house? Because at first all it was, was that little 12 foot by 40 foot, you know, hole in the ground. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, it's an, it's, it's an indoor pool. They're like, seriously? I'm like, no, <laughs> we're not doing that. But uh, yeah, so um, what will end up happening is, we'll actually insulate on top of this concrete slab and then we'll have like floating subfloor of the top. It'll do two layers of subfloor. This is something Steve, this is detail from Steve, um, basic and stuff. So eventually uh, here soon, it's going to just in the inside, just going to look like a conventional wooden subfloor framing, you know, we'll frame our interior walls inside. Um, so it, it wouldn't be like, um, a concrete it won't be a concrete floor so we can we'll put you know wood floor carpet down whatever tile whatever kind of flooring you want to do and stuff so um it's kind of hard to understand or see those details from this but as you can see the kids were learn we're getting lines chalk there doing the three four five bringing the math into it for the kids um then air air sailing details uh again this is another one from jake and steve uh, you can see also laying there, we built with the T-studs. Uh, we partnered up with them on this project. It was pretty cool to do that. Um, um, we got quite the wall assembly. Uh, all right, walls are going up. Um, you can see the ground is wet and muddy. It's been pretty much that way um, almost constantly. Uh, oh, these are just our, uh, the kids had to insulate the T-stud headers and stuff. They did their own. They made their own T-stud headers. Those turned out pretty good. Uh, inside, outside, this is kind of a, I use this, I was showing this as an example on Instagram, how we, uh, our, our garage is technically outside, even though it is underneath the same roof, but when it comes to our thermal and air, um, envelopes, uh, the garage is outside. So we taped everything off before we put to our garage wall up. And then that zip sheeting is actually zip R sheeting. So it's a zip R nine with continuous insulation all the way around. We brought in the big old telehandler, set trusses. So we did that for a few days with the kids. Um, Sega throw, that, provided that us. Is, sorry, ahead, sorry, is that the, the telehandler? Is that that truck that was right there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big old forklift and it had a truss boom on it. So it's, it's a telescoping forklift. And then what do you do? You rent that? Yeah, yeah we had to rent it, which That's sucked because cool. we rented it. And we're getting ready to all go. And then it freaking rained for like a week. And it just yeah. sat there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mike knows. Being a con talking about the contractor. And, uh, expenses. That's why I bought one. I, I used to own one. When I had it, when yeah. I had it, when I was a contractor, uh, me and my buddy, we, we bought it um, when the market was down for 19000 Sold about eight years later for 20000 <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> um, so... Uh, yeah, the here's the uh, detail where we sealed off our zip sheeting to the foundation. Uh, thanks to Sega for sending out some fin trim tape to us. That stuff is amazing. If anybody's ever worked with Sega products, holy moly, that is some good tape. Um, and then here's kind of where we're at. Uh, this was not today. This was two yesterday. Yeah, yesterday was nice and sunny. Um, the kids are up there. We got the sheeting on this side of the house. And uh, they were taping the taping the um, zip panels up top. Uh, we've actually got that the back part sheeted, the front over the garage, and this down the right hand side of this we have probably just over half of that sheeted here today before it started raining on us and stuff. So uh, and, and we're looking to have. The, the sorry, roof. those are, those are the high school kids up there. Yep, that's awesome. Yep, got them all roped off. Although I had to tell Colton after I took the picture to pull a slack line in there. I think if he fell off the scaffolding, I, I don't think it was going to do much for him. 
<laughs> they, 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 they found uh, to hate the, the harnesses just like everyone else. I, like I tell the kids, the harnesses are there to save you when you trip over your harness rope. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, like, a, like a motorcycle, you dress for the crash, not the weather. Exactly. Yep. Yep. I go, the, the, the ropes are going to be what sends you sliding down. I said, but that's what's also going to keep you from hitting the ground. But uh, we're actually working on getting, so if I, when the Harbor, Harbor Freight Tools for School thing, we'll be finishing off getting enough scaffolding where we can build all the way up two layers, fully decked, handrails all the way around. Right now we could do one full side almost. We don't have enough walk planks yet. Um, and at this point we were wait, we're still waiting for our handrails to come in. Um, so that's why we're pretty much tied off, even if we're on scaffold at the moment. So we're, we're trying to get it so we don't have to mess with the, uh, the ropes and tie offs and stuff. But this year we're still, we're, we're, we're still, uh, tied off to the roof and stuff, which it's fine. the kids need to learn it. So as much of a pain in the butt, it can be, it's part of staying alive. Cool. So yeah, there's the update where, uh. We are almost fully under roof. Um, probably right here after Thanksgiving, we'll be under shingles and stuff. And uh, whatever the weather does, we don't care. It'll just be cold inside because uh, we can't we we can't hold heat until we get uh, the lid air sealed and stuff. So, um, but uh, yeah, we're just about shedding water, and that's the big one of the big first steps uh, when you're building the house. Cool. I I got a couple questions about like the process right here so that slab part um well my question the crawl space wh where is that it's not the garage it's not this part is that what side of the house is that on uh actually if you so if you went through the garage there the door you can't you can't see it it's right down the middle of the house um and, and I'll, I'll address this here soon on instagram to talk more about it i really haven't talked much about it on it um, other than just a quick little highlights here and there. Um, Got it. Okay. Just because we've been so focused on the uh, kind of other, the progress details and stuff. But because what we'll do is once that roof's on, we'll go in there and we'll start uh, framing the crawl space pretty much like we would if you're remodeling um, or, you know, doing a basement or whatever, you know, we'll, we'll build our walls inside there for our floor joists to line up with the top of our insulation. I'll get stacked on the concrete so we can sh um, sheet over the top of it. So that, that hybrid crawl space slash slab um, explanation will kind of, kind of come in here real soon. Um, okay. And then I got another question about the rock wall. Um, oh, the rock wall? Rock, rock wall. Sorry. That's, yep. that's in this, that goes in the bottom floor of the, of the crawl space. Yeah, so what you're looking at right there, that's the bottom of the crawl space. So we 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 poured concrete in the bottom of the crawl space, and there's the stego wrap um, that stego provided for us, which was awesome. And then rock wool is underneath that, and then they poured concrete on top of that. And then what we'll do is we'll run rock wool up the side of those walls, and then there'll be insulation, a different type of insulation going across the top of the the um, slab parts that all tie together so that that becomes one big insulated all the way out to the walls kind of goes up and stuff so insulation comes down from the walls comes across the floor goes down underneath the slab because the crawl space will actually heat and cool and everything it's it's it will just even though it doesn't have a stairs i mean it has a like an access well to it from the garage um we count the the crawl space as part of our inside of our house so we heat it cool it treat it just like um, it, it, you know, like I said, we'll, we'll just pretend it's a basement with only a four and a half foot ceiling. Did, did you say you put concrete on top of the rock wool and the sheet here as well? Yep. Yeah. So the Get rock wool becomes that thermal break underneath there, and then that stego wrap is your uh, your your moisture barrier. Oh, so we can't see it, but there's concrete on top of the rock wool, and then there's this sheet. No. It goes rock wool, yellow, wrap, concrete. Okay, so that, that's just not in the frame, but that's coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll talk like, more about that here soon. Yeah. All right, this is how you know I have no clue. I would have never thought that you would put uh, like a concrete uh, crawl space and then rock wool and then a sheet and then 
concrete again. I would have never guessed that in a million a million yeah. years could have passed by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it goes dirt or well, actually, drainable rock, stone, rock wool, plastic, concrete. Oh, there's not there's not concrete underneath the rock wool. Nope, just just drainable stone. Wow, this is amazing. All right, all right, and that's all. And then there's tile the- drainage in there into a sub pump pit and all that good stuff. Oh wow! So I keep all that all ground so that- ground moisture yeah, exactly. in check. And this is all so that you don't transfer all that cold into the into the heated space or vice versa yep. or whatever. Yep. Wow, this is amazing. Okay, okay, okay. I didn't mean to get so detailed, but to me, it's no, like fascinating. Yeah, no. Nope. Okay. Good questions. That's awesome. All right, cool. Um, all right, that's a good update. Um, now, uh, we're going to get to Mike in a second, but we wanted to talk to Jay real quick. Um, Jay is a uh, Harbor Freight uh, uh, award winner. And uh, we're switching gears. We're going to head over to Jake. Uh, sorry, Jay for a second. Jay's in a previous episode. He gave us a tour of his uh, high school auto shop. And um, he has won the, one of the Harbor Freight Awards. And uh, so, Jay, what was it like? Did they surprise you? Yeah, it, it was a total surprise. Um, my, my, I guess my administrators kind of just orchestrated the whole thing to, like, receive the toolbox and the check and all this stuff. And then they just, like, paraded this whole thing upon me. So pretty cool that's awesome yeah I, it's it's amazing it's not just like one of these uh like awards where they just send you an email or something they go to your school and sneak up on you and surprise you with a big check yeah it's like publisher's clearinghouse man like i, <laughs> I got the big check i did the oh my god you know kind of thing and it was what, great so do you have any photos from this uh, I do, but I'm doing this from my phone, so I, I can't screen share with those, sadly. I could probably find them. So, are did they publish anything? I'm sure there's a video. Um, I'm sure it's on our it's on our uh, Facebook page. If you look at uh, Freedom Auto Club or Freedom High School Auto Club on Facebook, I'm sure all that stuff's on there. Okay. And what about uh, so now you've won the uh, the, the fifty thousand dollar award, which fifteen of it goes to you, but then the other goes to uh, goes to the um, uh, you know to the uh, to the school. Well, to yeah. your program specifically. Yep. yep. And do you have a plan? What do you plan on doing with the money? I do. Um, the big ticket stuff is a, a new tire changer wheel balancer for us. Um, I just came back from SEMA last week. I was you know doing my best to to just knuckle beat people to give me some good deals and. Um, I haven't quite made my decision yet, but I'm, I'm looking at the Hunter equipment. Um, I think they got the best stuff. It's, it's going to end up being like 20 grand, which, <laughs> which is a ton of money. Um, but you know, it's an investment that'll outlast me. I, I think if, if I go that route. And so, um, that's a big ticket thing. And then actually I'm going to buy some more engines for my small engines program, get a, get a second engine. Um, and we don't have any space. Um, I teach small engines on folding tables. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I have all these great ideas, um, but I'm going to bite the bullet and I'm going to buy 12 Harbor Freight carts and mount those, you know, like tool carts and like mount the engines to those. And um, so a couple of things like that, I'm going to buy a brand new Autel scanner um, for, you know, OBD2 and, and trouble codes, um, you know, for doing diagnostics on the auto side. And um, that's about it. That wraps up 35 grand pretty quick. Yeah, I've got. I might have a solution for mounting those engines. <laughs> Can we preserve? Our- it's almost. It's almost ready. I keep saying that, but <laughs> Brant, Brant's going to kill me because he says I should just release it already. But basically, I've got this uh, engine stand that makes it a lot easier to uh, 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 to mount those engines. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe I'll set you up with one. Uh, yeah, I think I think you told me last time that we talked on that. So yeah, now I'm now I'm definitely gonna need them. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, I got you. Uh, so this is it right here. I think they got some video of you. This is it. Yeah, it was. I told you it was a whole production, um, and they really they really did a good job pulling it off. Um, you know, they asked me right away if if I if I was surprised. 
Um, but I, you know, I thought I was going to win. I just, uh, you know, didn't know it was going to be that day. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, you deserve it, man. This is a really cool program. You're totally into it. Like you're immersed in, uh, uh, teaching the kids. I, if, if people in here, if you haven't seen this episode, it's so cool. It's basically like a hot rod shop and, uh, all his kids get to participate in like, you know, airbrush, uh, uh, auto body and whatnot. Uh, do you do anything with the English wheel or, or pole max or anything like that? Yeah, we do. Um, I have a really talented metal guy that comes help us on our auto club nights. Um, he like, he's one of these cheap metal guys that could, that should be on TV. His name is Dave Byron. And, uh, oh, I remember this. Yeah. He helps us fabricate all kinds of stuff. And so we, we do have an English wheel, you know, a bead roller and, um, we will hand form sheet metal stuff, you know, specifically like floorboards. And uh, right now for our C10 uh, pickup truck, the, the kids are actually making a hood scoop um, out of aluminum, you know, kind of like the old, um, uh, oh man, brain fade, um, like a shaker hood kind of thing for it. So, um, and they're, you know, they're doing that all by hand. That's all hammer and, and English wheel. And it's, it's pretty awesome. But yeah, that's, that's a skill set that like I barely have. So um, Dave comes in and I've learned a ton from him. It's awesome. That's cool. I have a pole max at the school, which is super rare, uh, but you don't quite need it. Although it is interesting because you can make your own tooling and you could uh, put a detail in. Um, so pretty cool. Look at this. This is awesome. Yeah. And that's Stacy. She's literally 10 minutes. Like our, our districts are neighboring. Like she's 10 minutes from me. Oh, is so that's the one who gave you the award. No, she. Uh, that's a, that's Seymour. Um, there was actually another winner ten minutes down the road from me. Oh no way! Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, ask her if she wants to jump on the show. We're uh, trying to get all the Harbor Freight winners on the show. Oh, I totally will. I can email her absolutely. Oh, please do that. That would be great. You know, it's funny if it, if there was if anybody like a let's say a potential sponsor or a supplier was listening to this podcast. I try and say it every single time. This is it. That Harbor Freight uh, Tools for School list, the finalists and the award winners. If you ever wanted some, some information on like what the teachers are, what the teachers are thinking or what they need or whatever, these are the best teachers around. Uh, it's been filtered for you. It's almost like a done deal. This list is great. You know, so I've been saying that we'll see what happens with that. I, I really think that um, uh, uh, the Harbor Freight tools for schools is such a good thing. And they they really do. They have all the teachers step up and come out of the woodwork. How would we find you anyway? We found yeah. you through Harbor Freight. How would there would be no other way for us to find you? Maybe totally. Instagram if we're lucky, maybe Instagram. So it's great that you won the award and uh, got your back. That's great. That's awesome. Um, all right, let's get over to, uh, oh, and Brent, you want to give us an update? Hold on. Wait a second. Before, before we leave, Jay, where's the green motorcycle? Last time you were on, we left with us, uh, drooling about the green motorcycle <laughs> in the hallway. Um, yeah, that one. Um, so we, we raffled that off and made a bunch of money on it. It was awesome. Um, and the guy wrote it for like a month and he's like, I don't know, man, it's not really my style. He sold it to one of my high school kids, one of the kids that built the bike. So, um, that student graduated, he's enlisted in the air force in Georgia and that's where that motorcycle is. Awesome. Do you got any on the, uh, on the blocks right now working on? Uh, we have, um, we got a little bit of a, another Sportster build going. Um, going to be a little bit of a longer because it, it was a bushel basket. So, you know, we're, we're kind of um, taking it piece by piece. But the uh, we're getting a little car shift going right now. I've got a 37 Olds and uh, in this CJ Jeep and, and our C10. So I'm, I'm trying to clean up what we got going before we go too far into some other ones. <laughs> I'm out of space. <laughs> Nice. That was awesome. Congratulations. Well, they too. talked me into the motorcycles though, because they're always like, Yeah, motorcycles don't take up much space. And I'm like, That's it. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I keep on trying to squeeze them in my garage. I tell my wife the same thing. That's right. <laughs> Say no, you know. I mean, I can't. <laughs> uh -huh. Or cool stuff. Oh, and uh don't forget about the fashion boutique, the pretty pink fashion boutique. This is your wife's uh 
of, of not a food truck, but it's a boutique truck. Yep. That's her business. That's awesome. So, yeah, this was a good episode. I remember we <laughs> a lot on this one. That was cool. Uh, and if anybody wants to get the back episode, you just go to um, Shop Class Podcast YouTube. I'm trying to keep it up to date. Uh, uh, and uh, I think I'm going to, ch- I, it's, it's not on a podcast platform right now, although the old episodes are. Um, and, uh, uh, but you can listen. You can listen to it on YouTube or watch it. You know, because it's kind of visual anyway. So here it is, right here. And whoop. okay. So you see, we've got a whole bunch of Harbor Freight winners. We got the Brain Bucket right there, uh, and then Jay. Jay is here. This is Jay's episode. That was a good one. Good shop tour of the whole place. Oh, I forgot that. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. And then uh, you might be interested, Jay, in this episode where we talked with um, Google uh, Works, and what yeah, what he does is uh, he makes custom parts for uh, the BMW aftermarket BMWs, um, but specifically like the two thousand twos. Oh man, uh, like parts? Does he make body parts? Yeah, he make not body parts, but he makes like, he'll make like pieces like. He'll make like a, a a chin. Oh yeah, yeah. And he's got a pole max and, and an English wheel, and he does it all by hand. Right. And on. he's got he also has wheels, and it's a pretty good episode. And the guy is totally like a craftsman. You know, it's great. He's got he's got all the stuff, and then he explains it as he goes. Um, here's the pole max doing a detail because you can make your own custom tooling for the right. pole. Um. So it's pretty good. It's a pretty good episode. It gives an overview. Uh, that's a good one. He makes steering wheels and interior panels as well. So pretty cool. All right. Uh, let's get over. Thanks, Jay. Um, yeah. Okay. Brant, you want to give us what's happening? Then we're going to get the mic. I'm, Mike, usually it doesn't take this long to get to the guest. We usually go right away. I'm sorry. I appreciate the callback. I was just going to say we're always working on some uh, viewers will have to tune in next week to get an update from me. The very best service I could do to this podcast this evening is yield my remaining time to the honorable distinguished gentleman from northern, mid-southern Alaska and give the table to Mike Pinocchio. You guys are in for a treat. This is a special guy. All right. Brent is this guy. I love Brent. He's awesome. All Thanks. right. We're going to hand it over to Mike. Mike, coming to us from Alaska. This is awesome. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I, I, I've listened to, um, two of your episodes and I really think that you got something going. Uh, this is it right here. So you want to tell us a little, oh, actually, let me start with the first question I ask every guest, which is, did you have shop class growing up? I did. Mr. Fozer, eighth grade. <laughs> it's amazing. You remember his name. <laughs> it is amazing. You- I remember his name. But he was Fozer. And <laughs> yeah. what did you guys do? Oh, uh, we made a gumball machine. I remember that. That's actually pretty cool. Uh, out of wood. Out of wood with a ball jar and a doll. You know, nice. Learned how to use a drill press. Yeah. He, he did all the rips when we weren't in the room, but and we had a radial arm saw to do our cuts with no guard. You know, classic. <laughs> That's yep. great. Yeah. Duke teaches middle school. Duke, you teach eighth grade, right? Yeah, I'm in eighth. I got the eighth graders. We were on the chop saw today. They love it. I have one cool. kid in the um the hold stick, and then the other kids they go down two hands, and I'm on the other side. Cool. Hey, Duke, you done any uh gumball machines? No, nah, but I look at them. I look at them online just the for machine. ideas. It's a cool idea because it's you know it's like mechanical. That's but you have cool. to have, find someone to uh, donate the ball drawers. Gotcha. So, Mike, uh, now how did you get into the contracting business? Well, I mean, it's pretty long, convoluted story, but I did a bunch of different things. Um, but I always, I always built. Since I've been in Alaska, I always built houses on my on the side. So 
I didn't really want to pay rent when I was young. I didn't really like that. So when I got here, I you get land cheap, and I, I built a little place, and you bought a book, built it. I had a regular job, and then and then I decided I wanted a bigger house, so I built another one, and then I sold those, and I and the I looked at how much money I was making in my job, and how much money I could make building houses and selling them. And I've been doing lots of side work, so I just went into contracting. It just was obvious that that's where I was going. I, and to me, this is I, I, I love this story. You know, I, I, it's, it's your story, so you might take it for granted. But for me, this is amazing. You went out to Alaska and you built your own house when you were a kid? Well, I was, I mean, I, the, the first place I built, I was 27. That's like a kid. Yeah, 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 for sure. And, and, <laughs> Yeah, I was pretty. I, I was pretty ambitious and determined, and uh, I just didn't want to pay rent anymore. And 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 at the time, there was a huge building boom here, and you could go to the transfer site and get so much plywood, and and all your cripples and and so much of the wood that you needed to build a house. You know, I had to buy some studs and I had to buy some plywood. But the first place I built was a lot of scraps from the from the all the houses the big houses that were going up on the hill. My first house was definitely not on the hill. <laughs> it's the bottom of the valley. But um now I'm I'm from New New Jersey. I don't even know the hill, the 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 valley nothing means nothing to me. Where where give me like the general area we're talking about. Well, I live in Fairbanks. I'm in the center. It's if you live in Anchorage, you think it's flat here because, the, the, you know, the, the Alaska Range is pretty far south of here. And this is a kind of a big open um, um, floodplain between the Alaska Range and the Brooks Range in the, cent in the center of Alaska. So there's some hills, though. And because it's warmer in the hills in the winter, we have a temperature inversion when it gets really cold. Let's say it's minus 40. You know, it, it might be minus 40 in town, but it's only minus 20 in the hills or minus 10. So you prefer to live in the hills and you got a view and that kind of thing. So land in the hills when I started building was out of way out of reach for me. Um, okay. And, you know, the, this whole thing evolved. I mean, I, at first it was just, I was just a one man show with very little direction and definitely no business experience, no business acumen whatsoever. And, you know, I worked my I worked my butt off at night or in between jobs to figure out how to do all that stuff. And then eventually hired people and things really took off. And I, I see on Instagram, there's a photo. Young Mike. Is this you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's me in my first place. Remodeling it before it's even finished because I, 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 I threw up a wall and I was like, I don't like this wall. And I made it, I just changed it. I rearranged the kitchen before I even built it. So, but that was the beauty of being young and, and like willing to work till 11 at night all the time and not caring. Like I was so into it. Yeah. There's something cool about that. That goes in phases. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's gone now. It's, I, I <laughs> it's very limited these days. <laughs> very funny. limited. Um, is this a, is this an episode about this? No, I think that. I can't I can't read which episode that is. Wait, here we go. Oh, that's just the that's just the intro. Okay. Okay. To, that's to cool. the podcast. And the podcast really evolved. I you know, in March this year I didn't know I was gonna have a podcast. I came I stumbled on the idea in April and launched it in May. I I and, think you're doing a great job, by the way. Thank you. I um and you know, it came out of uh it came out of the you know, I started writing a book about this, about kind of a framework for for builders to have when they start the contracting business a few years ago. And uh, and that happened because as I was running my crew, I realized that we were doing so many things over and over and I was doing things starting over every time. And I started making all my activities and actions repetitive and started really organizing how I do things. So I didn't have to do things twice and I could just print things off and hand it to my crew and really dial things in. Um, and it really allowed me to focus on the rest of the business. 
so I, you know, I kind of structured this book based on those years while it was happening. I, I wrote the book. And then now I just said, thought, well, let's see what a podcast does. And it's been super interesting because I didn't know that there'd be so many contractors and people in the industry willing to share what they know, too. Like, it's it's amazing to me. I thought I'm going to start saying this stuff and people are going to say, oh, why are you giving away the secrets or why would you do that? And, and instead, it's a lot of young builders saying, thank you. This is awesome. And then other builders that are experienced saying this is great. Like, let's do more. And, and not have this be a secret because there is no guideline. There's no, like my, uh, Brant and I were talking about the other day, there's no entry point into the construction industry. It's, we all just stumble into it. Oh, that's, a, I, I really like your use of the phrase entry point. I think that's a super important um, gate or door to talk about because, you know, the entry point into teaching is not always obvious. The entry point into any of these professions, like I, I literally like would go to the junkyard because I had no car people around me, but I was like, I had the car bug. So I went to the junkyards and I bought a Yugo. That yeah. I, yeah. Yugo. Dude, that was my entry point. That was the first car that I bought that was mine. You know, I bought it for like 200 bucks from working at the gas station, you know, <laughs> And then I and then I fixed it to have frozen calipers and a linkage problem with the shifter, and I sold it for a profit. Who would it, that's what kind of entry point is that? That's crazy, you know. But from there, yeah, you learn. Yeah. Sorry, what were you saying? Oh no, I, I I'm just listening. To, and I give I give Brant full credit for the entry point because that came out of a conversation we had on my podcast the other day, and I it's. Like brought up that that um about the trades in general really an nice. important point to raise here is that the the guys in this room serve as the only real well-constructed entry point to our industry the guys in this room are catching kids who are young who are expressing an interest something hands-on and they capture them at that stage and then help foster them into their future roles. But past this point, once you go past the 2021, 20, 22, which is the most, the largest viable population of the workforce is folks who are a little older than that. Once you've gone through college or not gone through college, you've gone through those years of the wash and you've kind of started to settle on what it is you want to do. You're at that point, And then there is no, there is no real good place to walk in right on scene and go, I didn't have an interest in construction. What do I do? Where do I go? Who do I talk to? How do I get the education? Um, and that's why the work that Mike is doing with the contracting handbook is critically important so that we can have a place to point these people to and say, start here. Here's a great place to find your foundation and to, to be able to make an entry. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. I appreciate you taking the time to do that. Now, I got a question about the, this, um, you know, dialing down into, uh, you know, w what it is to enter into the contract business and, and not make the same mistakes that the past people have done and learn from everybody. I got a question about that. Did you ever read this book uh, called the, the Entrepreneur's Myth? Does anybody I, know about this book? I have not read that. I, I've set my whole class up around it. And we've talked about so, that, Ron. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. I so, wish I would have read it before I had a contracting business. <laughs> and me too. And it's still sinking in. But I think that, Mike, it, from what you're describing, you are basically making this book, but for the contractors. So just to give you a brief kind of thing about it, uh, is that this book takes the story of someone who tries to set up like a pie business, making pies, but instead... What happens is they just give themselves a job. They didn't write anything down. They're, they're, there's no method. And so he e emphasizes that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to be an entrepreneur. You can't just be the worker. You have to figure out methods so, you're, so that the people working for you uh, can get the best practices going. And I'm assuming that's kind of what, what you're talking about, Mike, right? 
Yeah, that's definitely part of it, you know, and, and the E-Myth is, uh, that's the E-Myth you're talking about. It's on my list of books I'm supposed to read, you know. It's course. a quick read, Mike, definitely. Just, you, um, you'll read it in a day. And I'm a slow reader. <laughs> uh-huh. Basically, what it is is that it, it, it gives you a chance to think about being the crass person of your business and not just be the crass person in your business. Mm -hmm. which, yeah. Which is a big difference. You're getting on top of it, basically. Like Brant has these brain buckets. You're getting on top of the data. You're getting on top of the methods. And same with the students. Like I can't just let kids just work on cars. Like, oh, here, go ahead. Yeah, they're gonna. They're not gonna put the tools back. They're not gonna. You know, they're gonna strip off all the threads. So I'm sure Jay can appreciate what I'm talking about. All, all the shop teachers that you basically have to have some sort of entry point method staircase. Uh, otherwise it's total chaos, you know, and then it'll just be you running around cleaning up and trying to, you know, it, it is total chaos when you're trying to start this small contracting business, it's absolute chaos. And I'm just trying to provide that like, okay, try this, just read this chapter and absorb it. You know, you know, you can read this book in six hours, but it's going to take three years to implement it all. Fair. That's a fair assessment. Yeah. Um, and and it and and, I, and everything I say in it, I'm not saying is perfect or how everybody should do everything, but it's what I did with what I had. You know, I, 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 there's definitely some criticism coming out of the podcast that's interesting to me, but but um, but I, I, I'm open to that too. I because the conversation that's evolving from it is so cool. Nice, you know, and and the. And the affirmation, you know, we're having these conversations and so many people are saying, wow, that's, I totally experienced that same thing. And I never thought about writing it down. I never thought about it's just something I experienced along the way and I moved on from. But I'm trying to let people know that we're all going through it. And it's everywhere in the world. All the, everybody that's doing this has the same business struggles, you know. And so I try, I'm not trying to go into the methods of how we build houses or anything because Cause that's so specific to where we live, you know, there's, I, I can look at Instagram and be like, what, are, well, I don't know what they're doing over there. And it's interesting to me, but, but that varies so much across landscapes, you know? So, so I'm just trying to focus on that part that none of us are good at when we go into business for ourselves. Like I'm good. At, I'm a, I'm a carpenter, you know, and I'm a problem solver, but, but, uh, you know, businessman, I'm, I'm pretty good at it now, but it took, a, it took a while, you know, this, this is amazing. Oh, my, uh, Matt, go ahead. I was going to say, right. Yeah. So like what Mike's talking about, I mean, I went through, uh, I mean, yep. Same boat. Like my boss that I worked for, he passed away from cancer. I was, I don't know, mid twenties, whatever. Me and a buddy, we had talked about, oh, it'd be cool to have a construction company. He used to, he was doing concrete. Or it'd be cool to have our own business, right? Um, I was a carpenter. He was a concrete guy. We're just like, everybody's like, what are you guys going to do? Like, I don't know. I guess I'll start a business. And we were sitting at the bar, came up with some names on a napkin. And then we went and talked to our accountant. We had our keeper receipts in, in a shoebox and gave them to our accountant, Matt, and said, all right, here's our keepers. And he's like, oh, my God, you guys. <laughs> I was like, you know, it was just one of those things where, we knew now that was one smart thing we did. We had, we had a lawyer set up our C or S corp and the accountant take care of that stuff. But dude, it was just some young mid aged or middle aged mid 20 year olds saying, Hey, you know what? We're young enough. We messed it up. We got time to recover. And all of a sudden we had a business and we were busy. Problem is we were busy. Doesn't mean you're necessarily profitable or as profitable mm. as you want to be anyway. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Brant. He had his, uh, he raised his hand, which is awesome. <laughs> That's better than my good student. Theory. Good student. <laughs> well, it's the right thing to do in a room full of teachers, you know. I raise my hand, so <laughs> wait to be called on. Um, it's very important that we all remember that just because we're working in the same industry, this is a very large umbrella. And that means that there is a very wide, vast, diverse range of experiences and startup stories of how people find their way through this. 
years. I mulled through my first couple of years, had no previous experience in this industry, came from 20 years in automotive background, and just thought that some of the hacks I'd figured out in automotive retail service could apply to what's happening inside of the job site construction skilled trades. Totally different path than, than some, but there's a lot of people who I've talked to who also have automotive backgrounds. There's a lot of connective tissue between those industries. The importance of the work that Mike is doing is laying some foundational pieces so that other people, when they do enter into this, or when they found themselves struggling through it for a couple of years, if they can grasp that knowledge, it helps them springboard past all those future failure and learning moments. They can adopt that knowledge, adapt it quickly, and then they can not only build upon their own body of success, which builders are very proud about, but they can also build upon Mike's previous success. So his 16 years of building now get added to the compendium of knowledge for these up-and-coming builders, and that's why it's important that they, that they look at this opportunity to read this book, absorb that knowledge, and then use the contracting handbook as their own guide to then bring in their next apprentice and the one after. And then you can start to create a curriculum. I know everyone in this room would be a fan of having a curriculum, but our industry doesn't have that structure. We don't have an established curriculum in residential construction for what that succession plan looks like. Mike is a critical component of this because now he's no longer just building houses, building legacies, and he's building infrastructure for our industry to stand upon as a base foundation for the future. It's incredibly important work. That's great. That's great. And Brent, I, and uh, uh, this is such, it's cr great to hear from like, you know, we've got like contractors in the room. So it's great to hear all the feedback, you know, um, what, you know, just, I can relate because I have a side business where I teach welding and I teach small engines uh, to anyone, not just the people at my day job or at the school. But the one thing I learned was actually to have an Excel sheet and look at your numbers. <laughs> you know, you got revenue coming in. That doesn't mean you got profit. <laughs> you know? uh, so and I, was lucky, I was lucky in my experience in automotive to do some things in multi-unit business management. And so I became accustomed to data tracking and trend tracking on PLs. And so I became very well versed in the business side of the blue collar skilled trades before I made an entrance in construction. And when I made my entrance in 2013, I kind of looked at the landscape and went, do I want to be a contractor coach or do I want to go see what I'm worth in, on the building field? And I chose to, to go the experience route first and to build and to see what I was worth as a craftsman and then start the storytelling years later. Mm, gotcha. Pretty cool. Uh, and Brent, it's, it's not the internet is, is okay, but if you could make any improvement to your internet, that would be perfect because it's kind of like I'm working on it. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, awesome. So, um, okay. So now, now it's funny that we brought up the E Myth book. Uh, so now this book is not out yet, right? Correct. I'm, I'm, uh, it is ready to be edited. I just have some, I've had a new idea recently that I'm running by uh, some other people before I publish it, but it, it'll be out in spring at the latest, I believe. I was going to publish about two weeks ago, but I changed my mind. I, I, I had a new idea to, to make it even better. That's cool. Yeah, I'm kind of in the camp where I'm trying to just check all the boxes that I would want out of the thing, although, although it is a balance between, you know, like, you feel like you're holding on to it, but like you also got want to try and make it good. Um, yeah. And I've got, yeah, I've got season two of the podcast that I'm recording right now. Mm -hmm. And because there's, because this podcast has gotten so much interest and my guest list is really pretty stellar. Um, I kind of want to wait and, and launch it after the second season uh, because there's so many great guests coming on and so many good conversations that are going to happen. And I think it'll bring more value to the book. If I'm, you know, putting some of those ideas that come out of those conversations in the book too. Yeah. Um, that's cool. And, uh, you know, what's, what's great is that, um, okay. And that way, no, sorry, this, and it's called the contract, the handbook. So now is it going to be like, 
Like how many, give us a ballpark. Like how many pages is it? Is it going to be audio? How do you get it? What, what's going on? It's going to be self-published on Amazon unless I can get someone to look at it. I've been trying to get publishers to look at, but I know that's super challenging these days. Um, so it'll be, there'll be an e-version. There'll be probably a paperback version. Um, cause I like paperback myself. I like to hold things. I, e version is good too, but I envision this book being able to be in the console of your truck. So if you're like working during the day and you're like, Oh man, what was that thing? in that one chapter, you can pick it up and read it. Nice. You know, but it's going to be, it's about, uh, 13 chapters and about 170 pages. There's a bunch of checklists at the end. It was it was close to 300 pages, so I've chopped it down. I had a I had a, a best selling author at Amazon read it, and he said this is three books, so make it three. Interesting. So I made it one, and then there's a lot of it that I can use for something else. Wow, so, that's cool. You know, I don't know if there's a shop class um, book either. So now there's no contracting book. I'm sure there's like a reference book. But there's, does, I don't know if there's a guide like this. I mean, you guys. There's, are there's definitely nothing like what I've done. I've done the research. I've, I've, if the book existed, I would own it because I've bought every book that's tangentially, tangentially related to the field. You know, I would read everything because I don't, because I, I was just thirsty for knowledge and I want to quit wasting time. You know, I'm a contractor. Wasting time makes me insane. So what would be like what would be like the like a close cousin uh uh, uh you know book that, that that's out there There's a book about contracting that a guy wrote but it it's not really well it's not edited it's really repetitive it came out in like 2015 I think it's called Start Your Contracting Business um but I don't really have something to compare it to If so there's an author uh, that he's the guy who read my book. Um, he wrote a book called Remodel Without Going Bonkers or Broke. And I bought this book to make sure that I hadn't been scooped. You know, so I'm always looking as I'm writing this book. I'm, I'm on Amazon all the time, making sure that no one else has scooped me and that I'm not wasting my time. And um, and his book is the exact compliment to mine it's from an architect's perspective it prepares the client to work with a contractor and i've recommended this book now to tons of people because i'm like if you want to remodel and you know what you're doing read this book you can read it in a day and it will totally prepare you for how to deal with your contractor and i agree unbelievably with every like i agreed with everything in the book nice so check your messages i just sent you a message I didn't want to mention on the air, <laughs> but anyway, you got to check the typo there, but, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, yeah, this is awesome. You know, there's no shop teacher book either. I changed that back. That's funny. Is that, is, are you seeing that on the, on the, on my on, screen? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Someone uh, out right away and I changed it. So I'm going to have to see why that happened. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter. But anyway, yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's great you're making this book. I, I wish there was a shop teacher book. I mean, I had to learn the hard way. Uh, uh, you know, it was this guy, Mister Canito. You know, this is like the wood shop guy. You know, like he, he was out of, uh, you know, he was made out of wood. The guy could run circles around me while smoking a cigarette and yelling at everybody while cutting and drilling at the same time. You know, like yeah. it was just like. 41 years as a shop teacher and he used to build houses before in between uh college and and taking the shop teacher job uh cool. and he had his own carpentry uh job where he did like complicated stuff so it's just unbelievable but it was never written down you know so you know guys like that are you know they leave the industry and then uh or you know they leave teaching and they retire and then uh you know, they just kind of build uh, stuff for the neighbors for the next uh, whatever, and they retire. Mm -hmm. you know? So you don't you don't get to know what it was, you know. And uh, so somebody luckily is overlapping me. So we've overlapped a few people. So we kind of pulled some of that knowledge and some of that, uh, you know, know how of how to handle the, the shop. Like, for instance, we, we 
we had a supervisor once that wanted to move the entire wood shop. I was like, okay, you got all the all the air ducting, all the exactly. vacuum ducting, and all the electrical. I was like, you got two hundred grand because and and another year because that's not going to happen, you know. And but a new teacher would have said, oh, okay, sure, you know, like they wouldn't have known. So there's a lot of knowledge that needs to be passed down, and it just sort of goes it goes away with the people. So I'm glad you did this book. It, and am I right? Is that the flavor of the book? It's like this is. It, almost like an apprenticeship in a book, right? Yeah, but it's the, yeah, it's but it's definitely focused on the business side because you have your trade. You could be a plumber starting a business and read this book, and it'll give you the same thing. Any trade, Interesting. anybody who wants to start a business in the trades can get tons of value from it. There will be things in any book that aren't relative, aren't totally relative to what you're doing, like what your licensing requirements are or something. But the baseline's there for anybody, and. You know, one of my friends here has been listening to the podcast to support me. And she said, you know, because I had described it to her before, before it went out, you know, and no one really, people who aren't contractors don't really get what we do. And she, I saw her a couple months after the show came out and she was like, so your podcast is not about construction. It's about running a small business. And I was like, yeah, it's about running a small, it's from a construction contractor's perspective on how to run a small business exactly it's not about how i build houses here in fairbanks alaska because that's totally weird to someone who lives in the tropics or something you know it does it's so or in or in the uk so yeah i could see it what you're saying so, so that's the whole that's the whole premise is that you know we all struggle with these with these issues when we start businesses because once it starts as as matt knows you know you're just like you your head's spinning because you're you work 12 hours a day you're tired and you come home and then you got six hours worth of work to do and you don't know how to do it i mean you start to learn but you know I have yeah a, you nail it mike i have a full appreciation for people that do this a friend of mine has a uh tree arborist uh business and i i went on the job with him a few times and like he climbs a tree with a running chainsaw hooked onto his belt. To me, this is like bonkers. I'm like, Oh my God. And he's up there cutting down and throwing the pieces. And then him, me and his brother would go get the pieces and then load it into the truck, which then he has to bring to the yard. And then after that, still do the paperwork for the whole job. I'm amazed at how all this happens. Um, and I'm sure by now, because like when he first started out, it's just him, a used truck, uh, 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 a used stump grinder. And like I helped him fix the stump grinder because one of the pistons was leaking and we've changed the head. You know, like it's just you and your buddies like just just all right, just put this thing. And then he's pulling out the the stump grinding nails, whatever they are, the claws. And he's got to he's got to sharpen them and put them back in or get new ones. Everything's done literally by hand on the spot amazing now he's got a truck with a robot arm that goes up to the tree cuts the tree down da, 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 and pulls it into the truck and he's sitting there with a computer going like this he's listening to podcast he's playing a video game because he's basically playing with the truck and he's like yep yep and all he needs is a guy to make sure as a guide on the other side and that's it and it's like, wow, how did he evolve to that? That was that there's something there in that efficiency. Now he does three major cleanup jobs a day instead of one, you know? Yep. Unbelievable. And, and the truck is part of it, but how did you know that you could afford to get this truck to do what you wanted it to do? Yep. Yeah. You, you don't know when to make those moves and you don't know how to make those moves to make your life more efficient. And it seems like so much money, but then you spend the money and you go, oh, now I'm making money big time. Right. It, it, so. it's, I would say one of the biggest, the scariest things that I did was, was hire someone, mm. <laughs> which seems ridiculous. Of course, you should hire someone. I was terrified to hire another welder because my class is filled up. And the only way I could fill the, you know, have a good ratio was to hire another. So I hired a farm, former student. 
And I was like, oh, my God, I don't know how this is going to go. I was like, you know what? I'm going to just consider this job a loss. And it wasn't. I made money. I was like, yes. So I started hiring more people. It's unbelievable. But getting to that point is very scary. Yeah, you pay a lot of tuition getting to that point and not making much money. A lot of good way of putting it, tuition. (laughs) But but you got to learn somewhere, you know. And hiring someone, yeah, that's scary. And I talk about that a lot in the book, because because I knew I found at some point when I was working alone, I absolutely knew that there's no there was a limit to how much money I could make. And none of this book is about how to get rich. But it's definitely about how to not be broke as a contractor because a lot of contractors are broke. You know, yeah. we work so hard. And then at the end of the year, you go, oh, my, you pay all your bills. And you're like, what? My foreman made more than me. Wow. I know, that, I know that's happened to me. Yeah, I could see that happening. And, that, and I, that, that was one, you know, I, I don't really want to talk about that, but it happened. <laughs> you know, it's, wow. you know. So the whole point is to try and help people then, you know, fast forward through a lot of the stuff, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, stumbling blocks, a lot of those roadblocks you hit on the way. Yeah. Um, Now, should we, do you want to give some previews? Like, should I ask you questions? Like, um, what was your biggest mistake as a contractor? Uh, Maybe that would give a little insight, but not give away the book. If you feel that's a good idea, if not, we can move into another topic. Well, no, I'm I'm open to any questions. I, you know, I I made tons of mistakes as a contractor. I mean, nonstop at the beginning because I didn't hire. I I did my own book. I did everything to begin with, and thought I should learn how to be a CPA basically, and build my own website. Because it can't be that hard. You know, that's my attitude about everything is it can't be that. Hard. Now, now I farm everything out. You know, I just organize and make phone calls and, and, and I do a lot of craft work, but, but all the other stuff is farmed out. So I think the beginning, the biggest mistakes were, were just taking on too much, too much load to my head and not sleeping enough. And I didn't take care of myself. And I, I would have made a lot more money at the beginning if I, paid someone else to do the stuff that I was, I didn't need to learn how to do. Wow. You know? I, th- I feel like you're describing me right now because <laughs> I do my own website. I do, I do my, you know, I do, I do a lot of the, basically I do all the, all the accounting and everything. It's like, and it's, um, I spend a lot of time doing that. So I'm like, Oh my God, there's gotta be another way. Brant's got his hand up. Go for it. Mike is speaking to a lot of people right now, not just in the construction industry, not just in the automotive industry. He is talking to anybody who is smarter than this rise and grind culture, which teaches young people a horrible lesson that we should all get out there and just work harder, work ourselves into oblivion. It's a crucial mistake to try and do in contracting. There's too much bandwidth required. There are too many details to remember to do it successfully. To Obi-Wan, you listen. To Obi-Wan Kenoki, you should all listen because Mike is talking Mike is talking pivotal truth about sleep, about self-care. These are things that are crucially lacking across the skin trades. Construction especially, we are under such duress, such a critical crisis-level labor shortage that everyone is trying to be two people. Everyone is trying to do twice the the work volume, work the later hours. And there's a growing subculture of people who are overlooking, overworking, and it is a mistake. It is not a sustainable future. Mike knows the way. Read this book. Listen to this man because he is speaking critical truth about sleep and self-care, two of the most critical, important components for every young up-and-coming entrepreneur or first-time business owner, or second-time small business owner because your first business failed. Second-time small business owner, if you're not successful, if you're not counting your stacks, if you're not looking at the surplus, if you didn't adjust your wage plus the money you wanted for growth this year while setting aside money for retirement, you need to be taking in information like Mike's book. Interesting. Interesting. 
This is awesome. I'm going to read it for sure. I, you got a customer right here. I can't wait. Now, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh. Oh, thanks, Brant. I mean, that's you, – you have – you got – you are very eloquent with the way you describe what I'm doing. I need to just hire you to be my spokesperson. There you go. <laughs> Or and, your editor, probably probably better as an editor. <laughs> now, is there any chance that there's going to be an audio version? Because I got to tell you, I fully enjoy listening to the author uh, read their book because I feel like yeah. it comes from the heart. And I've already heard your voice on the podcast. I think you do a really good job. So if you ever felt like reading it, uh, you got a listener. I'll buy the hard copy or soft copy, whatever. But, uh, yeah, if you ever do that, that would be awesome. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, my, I'm definitely going to do a uh, – I'm going to read it. My, I've, my, uh, two of my subcontractors, my closest subs, have read it, and they both love ebooks, you know, and podcasts. So, you know, they, they choked it down and read it, but, um, but they both want to hear it. And they, they're like, you need to just get this on Audible and get it out there. And I will. I've got the equipment to do it. It's just, it's just a matter of time and, you know, getting it edited. And, no but problem. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've, I've gotten really into the listening to other podcasts since I've been doing mine. So I, I, I can really relate to listening to it. Some things I need to have in my hand. It's maybe it's just because I grew up in a time when, you know, we took notes in our books and stuff, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I tell but the like, kids all the time. <laughs> that, that I that I I used to use a rotary phone, and they're like, "What's that?" <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Oh man, I made a mistake. And you spin and twist the cord all around your legs as you're talking. Oh, the cord was awful. <laughs> yeah, then we had to we had to run home from school, call our friends to see what they were doing. With, with the you know the um, some of the odds, you may have to talk to their parents. Yeah, be nice to them. Like, hello, yeah. hello, Mister or Mrs. Smith. Is there? May I speak to Eric? I still remember my parents giving me the uh, textbook lines. Yep. And then uh, you know, <clears throat> now these kids are easy. They get. Right on the phone, yeah. text. Today, the, the kids asked me, they're like, did you text the girl, your, like girls in high school? I'm like, we didn't have text in high school. <laughs> yeah. There was a teacher talking about college, and they were talking about emails or something. I said, I got my first email address in high school. They said, you're not going to use it. Just keep it. Or I'm in college. Then I graduated. I never used it until I got a job. So only the rich kids had answering machines at their houses when I was in high <laughs> My the freshman rest... told me today that, that the... I, I've been talking to them about jump drives. Apparently, they, I've been talking for three days. They don't know what a jump drive is or a thumb drive. They don't know how to download. So... Jay, do, the, do your kids know how to put a file to another file or create a file? I oh, God, no. That. They can't like... save anything. Yeah, like but I was blown I away. I should have like, caught on to that before I did the jump drive thing. Yeah, I'm like, I was like, wait, you guys don't know how to create a file? I was like, you guys are like the computer people. But they're not the nope. computer people. They're the video game and phone people. And they and, and they didn't get this. I had to teach. I had to do a lesson at the beginning how to reply back to an email because most of my students at senior year haven't even opened their email that they've had since fifth grade. And it has like 3,000 emails in it. Yeah, I'd give them the save speech all the time. Like, how many computer programs have the word file on it? Same space, left-hand side, file, save. Like, I tell them, there's many programs like this. They don't know how to save a file. Is it because it's a, it, because everything's in the cloud and they don't actually have to save onto a computer because they don't even probably use a computer? This is why, right? Yeah, yeah they're not a computer people. I'm like, you guys grew up with computers. And then I was like... No, you didn't. You grew up with phones and video games. They're apps. Hey, Matt, They're app people. Hey, yeah, apps. Hey, Matt, Matt, what does that email address look like? Is it Betty, Betty Boom Boom 69 420 at Yahoo? What is that? No, they, they don't have their own email address. They have their school email address that they've never opened up. 
And then they get in there and, and, and they're like, oh my gosh, the teachers like are e emailing us. I'm like, yeah, funny. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy That's how so that works. Oh man, it's too much. Uh, yeah, there's a huge gap. Uh, you know, I, I, there was a gap, but the gap's bigger now. <laughs> it's like, you know. Uh, so uh, well, you know, we're in that group where, like, you, you know, we were talking about corded phones, dial phones, running home, calling your friends. We talk to people on the phones, and then we also grew up how to use the internet. You know, dial up. You know, all you know, we 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 we've moved through it. So we're like the last generation that knows how to go play outside with no technology, but yet how to use all the technology. Yeah. Where my kids only know how to use the technology. Yeah, we uh, basically remember, we go go ahead, Duke. Uh, remember, Matt was just talking about ca calling home again, but then I was thinking about my best friends growing up. But imagine when you had remember had a, you had to call a girl. Like I would be pacing just in case their parents would enter the phone. I'd be so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> now these kids well, just text. I'm not sure how it feel. It's calling the girl because it was it was hard to get private right with the with the phone back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially if there's two two phones on one line, then your siblings would pick up or something. It's so annoying. <laughs> oh man, good times. Oh man. So yeah, like everything's changing into the cloud. Hey, listen, we're gonna have chips in our head soon, so uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's happening. That's the scariest thing about it is like it or hate it, it's happening. The cars are gonna drive themselves, and we're gonna have chips in our head. Uh, maybe not in 10 years, but definitely 20 or 25. Who knows? Um, Google, Google vision. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Or like a chip in your eye or something. Um, so, uh, oh, I wanted to ask Mike, I wanted to ask you about the process of self publishing. Mm. Uh, I just thought of that question now. I didn't have that free, whatever. But so if you think about it, what a great, thing we got especially thinking about tech right like you don't have to get permission to publish this to the people that need it i think that you're i'm i'm i know i'm sure you're looking for a publisher that'd be great but i think it's great just me personally giving it my two cents my opinion i think it's awesome that you're going forward and doing the the self-publishing because can you imagine if you had to get permission from some you know from like pearson education to publish your 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 education book. I mean, that's crazy. So what is the process you're going through? Well, I'll, you know, at this point I, I need to edit it. I need to have a, you know, formal editor, uh, go through my terrible writing and, and then format it and drop it into the editor on, on Amazon and then put my art in, um, there's some other legal stuff and then you submit it and then their lawyers go through and make sure that it, there's no copyright infringements because they take 60% Whoa. At, min at minimum. Oh no. If, it, if like, if I, so I've sent this to entrepreneur magazine and Ta uh, Towton press and, and one other place and I haven't heard from any of them, but, but I know that if entrepreneur got it, I, they'd be get, they get 90%. And I'd be fine with that because they would distribute it everywhere. Yeah, the point just, is to get the info out. Yeah, yeah. And um, so it'll be harder to get it out on my own, you know, but. That's fair. But I mean, it's Amazon. The, public, the publishers I'm, I'm sending it to also, there's nothing quite like this. So it's not, it's not quite in any of their veins. I mean, like Towton Press, like the fine home building crew. They don't really talk business. They talk, they talk how to do stuff right, you know. But it's not like best practices for business, so it, it's kind of not in their vein. And then Entrepreneur Magazine, I mean, I'm just some dude. I'm not some flashy business guy, you know. So I'm, I'm not only, really. I'm only laughing because that's how no, I describe. You laugh. Okay. No, I. That's my line. You stole my line. I say that. I go, I'm just like a dude. How did I think of this? Because, yeah. You know, like, like when I, t when I, when I talk to the kids about, you know, 
a technique or a discovery I had or something we did, you know, I'm just like, listen, if I can do it, you can do it. I'm just like a dude in New Jersey. I'm just like a guy, you know, yeah. <laughs> but that's the bet. Those are the best guys, you know? <laughs> right. I'll, I'll tell you what, Mark, one of your biggest assets though, when it comes to marketing, distributing, especially with the podcast people you're getting on there, man, that Instagram is gonna, I, I think that, I think you're going to get a, I'm not going to say you're going to make your nut on it, but I think it'll be a nice free yeah. marketing for you. Yeah. And, and also uh, the hammer app has been really interesting because I haven't, I don't know if you guys all know what the hammer app is. It's a new app that's out there for, um, for the trades specifically. It's like Instagram for the trades. I don't know if anybody knows about we, it. We were but... supposed to have the uh, creator on here. Uh, yeah, me and Brack have been trying to get together and talk for a while now. He's, he's pretty busy at the moment, but, um, but so, so I haven't published an episode except for that teaser since, um, beginning of September. And I joined hammer in August, but I didn't post or anything. And then I started posting there in late September. And now my, my podcast has more traffic than it ever did while I was publishing. So, so that app is also really people are getting there's a lot of interest there because a lot of young people who are starting businesses there and they have no idea and they see this and they're and they're getting onto it. So it's pretty interesting too. Is this it right here? That's yeah, sometimes yeah. I'll get like um the uh hammer app on Instagram. So I said, right. ah, what the heck? I'll sign up for it. Mike, you actually commented on my uh chop saw post. I didn't even realize it. Now we're on the same uh, podcast. Yeah. You wrote, uh, yeah, your teacher's name. The same thing you said in the, in, oh. the, in the beginning. Your teacher did all the uh, cross-cutting for you. And you, uh... Let's see. Cool, I'll I remember. On the... Yeah, I'll get some positive feedback. Cool. Just to show the uh, contractors out there that the kids are working in the shops. Uh, yeah, it's right here. Yeah, 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 right there. Perfect. But it's on the Hammer app, though. Oh. Same post, but I posted it on both platforms. I'll post more on the Hammer app than Twitter. How do you post? Oh, there's oh, not on Instagram, but there's an app? There's an app for your phone. Correct. Called Hammer. I, I got to catch up. I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. It's we, cool talked about it's it. we, we talked about it a couple times on here. This one here? Oh, okay, okay. So it's on the phone. Interesting. All right, all right. So you pull up. You pull you, your students up. could probably know how to load it. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. I have no idea what's going on. Oh, I, I actually have it. I got it. Then, like, Breck, Breck will send you uh, stickers every once in a while. I'll give them to the kids, hammer stickers. Yeah. Well, hey, Ron, we were, I forget who had us connected with him. He was supposed to be one of our guests and it was all lined up. And I, yeah. I forget what, why he couldn't come on or something that I don't night. Know he got busy or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. But I he's welcome. That, that was a while ago. He's welcome to come on. That would be great to explain this. I think it would be a good spot. Get the teachers involved. That's a pretty cool thing. It's oh, a and then, uh, one, too. You guys have a lot of connective tissue, the shop teachers and Breck. Because you're trying to make the same pivotal influence in up and comers and investments in the next generation. So there's a lot of connectivity between what you guys are doing and what Breck believes in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, it, it would be a great place for students to see other young tradespeople posting their work because you'd never see this work otherwise. You'd never see a first year apprentice posting his work online like they do on the Hammer app. And there, and some of these people work really neat, interesting stuff I've never oh. seen or thought stuff that happens at night when you drive by and you never get to look over the construction fence, you know. That's so, cool. yeah. Look yeah, at this. Breck made, Breck made a comment once, like, uh, you know, you're killing it on the hammer app, molding the next generation of legends. And I thought that was awesome because, you know, every Every construction site or shop teacher has that one one guy that you talk about the legend in your shop or on the site. 
And that's exactly what it is. You know, one day these kids are going to be legends too in somebody's eyes. Totally. I Oh, I've seen this one. Yeah, I sometimes watch the Instagram. I yeah, I guess I didn't really connect the dots in my – you know what's good about these these meetings is it really helps illustrate what's going on. I didn't realize it was an app. I mean, I downloaded it, but I didn't realize it was important. I just thought like, eh, that is an app. And it, you know, you get so many offers to do an app. But if you guys endorse it, now I'm going to check it out, you know. And uh, is this the guys involved? Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I mean, that would be great uh, to have him on here and explain it. Uh, you know, and I will I wonder if you can broadcast your screen of the app onto the podcast so we could talk about it maybe next time. I'll have to practice that. I think there's a way to, to, screen, to share my phone on the screen, right? That would be a way. I don't know. Wait, where are you, you guys are supposed to help me with that. <laughs> I Maybe need, one of your students. Do. I need to download a file. <laughs> yeah, you need an app for the app. For the app. <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, cool. So you basically you it's you're going to publish it. There's no way around it. They're going to take a cut. Uh, but I think yeah. it's important to get it out there. Yeah, I think you're doing the right thing. That's cool. Uh, I mean, uh, if you did it yourself, I guess the benefit would be that you, you would, you wouldn't have to pay them the forty percent, but, or sorry, the sixty. But you then have to then print these things, and you'd have to put an outlay cost. But on Amazon, I think they print on demand. Is that right? Yeah, and and so what I'll be doing is when I go to publish. I will be letting everyone know on Instagram, everybody on the hammer app. So I can get people to purchase it in the first week. And so I'll offer like, if you buy the ebook, read it. Cause you have to read 80% of the book to actually write a review, write a review. I'll send a, a signed hard copy because oh, nice. if you get, if you get, if you do really well in your first month, then Amazon, basically markets it for you like they know that people want it so they'll market it to everybody because most books on amazon only get only sell a thousand copies on average and then they die and i can't have that happen there's too much too much time put into this i like it i like the determination yeah um so but it's kind of like youtube where they're kind of like your partner in the business so that's what it seems like, like in a way, because if if you do well, they do well. So they want you to do well, but they want to see if you can do it, if you have the audience to do it. Uh, do you? Keep- they want to know that. They, they want to know that you're producing content, and they'll and then they'll help you. We have a uh, newsletter, and we, we'd be proud to put you on the newsletter. We could p- talk about. We could even prime them up if you had a. A preview to just get them plant the seed. Uh, we'll do okay. it with this. We'll do it with this episode. But um, uh, uh, what drop? Are we have, I think we have your email. I don't know. Drop your email in the in the comment, and uh, 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 my, uh, Matt will put put you on the newsletter. Okay, we'll do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking about other questions they ask you. Uh, Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna listen this week, and I have parent teacher conferences coming up, and uh, an opt out day before Thanksgiving. What's a good uh, episode? What's my starter? My starter episode. That's a great question. Um, just start at I number think the, one. The first yeah. episode. And here's something pretty- to think about, Mike. For teachers, we're also taking on way too many things that we shouldn't be taking on, and it's the same boat for teachers too. We're overworked, we're underpaid, we're doing too much. So think about that when you answer your question there. My my mom was a teacher, I know. Um I would say I'm looking at the episodes now. A lot of these are quick, which is nice too. Nine minutes, fourteen minutes, twenty eight minutes. Our shows are like two hours. <laughs> yeah, so my, my the my my shows that are 
just topical where I'm, I'm alone, they're short. It's like for between runs. And there's usually enough in there for you to think about for a week, you know. And then the interviews are an hour, sometimes longer. But um, you know, I, my, I really like my tire kickers episode. Um, that was good. And, I listened to that one. Um, you know the 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 you can't know everything episode was just like kind of my epis my like first thoughts for like. That you're gonna like make so many mistakes and and so when you can't know everything you gotta like either figure it out or or um or avoid the situation where you're saying you can't know everything or that you don't know everything well, um and that came out of it's in, I, I did the show so long ago now and when I started the shows it was really hard for me to express what i was thinking i really worked hard on it and it's, and it's and it's evolved and it's gotten a lot better but that episode came out of um i had one of my subcontractors totally blow something on me and we had to cut a lot of sheetrock on a job that was finished and and i i told him that, you know he had to i back build him for that work and he said he wouldn't pay because you can't know everything and and I said, you're a master plumber and you should have known this. And I shouldn't have I shouldn't have had to, you know, find out that you did it wrong. I, I'm not the plumber. So anyway, that's kind of what that episode's about. It's a good one. Um, What's it called again? What's that episode? It's episode two, season one, episode two. I'm looking for it. It's right at the beginning, and then, and then the cold calls uh, episodes are really people really like. There was um, one called "Wearing Too Many Hats" on there. Yeah, yeah, that one. Diet stress, diet stress, and something. Oh, here it is. You can't know everything. I'm just, I'm excited to listen to these. I feel like this is like it's not just contracting, but it's contracting that draws me in. I'm not going to be a contractor, but it's like. I feel like it's not just like a, it's not an NBA who went to Harvard explaining about small businesses who's clearly not running a small business or something. You've done it. So I've, you can, it's real, you know? Yeah. And yeah, some of it's pretty uh, philosophical at the beginning, but. Uh, the guy who wrote the book, uh, The Entrepreneurial Myth, he was a contractor. Mm. Yeah, he was a contractor and then. He was thrown into being a business consultant, sort of like his cousins gave him the job. And he just saw this. The story is that he showed up and he's like, they're like, what do you recommend? He's like, I don't know. What do you do? <laughs> and they're like, well, you're the consultant. He's like, I don't know anything about your business. Why don't you tell me? And then they went back and forth and he started writing down everybody's mistakes and documenting it and what he found over time was that people didn't have a method mm -hmm. and that was yeah. the problem and so it's the methods and it's the uh uh being prepared and you know it's all the experience that, you, that these people don't have that he figured out uh biggest problem is not having you know uh, like he 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 relates it a lot to mcdonald's not that you want to be mcdonald's but that you could have a method for your employees uh, and you are the creator of that method. Uh, and then this way you're not just getting like, it's not, it's not brand new. Every single, every single year is not, the, is not a repeat of the same year. Yeah. 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 You know, one thing that sticks out to me, Ron was our guest. Uh, that, um, oh, is it Josh? The, the one that started 3d, uh, um, into 3d printers remember he's a full-time yeah. engineer but mike was talking about delegating and hiring people and blah 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 you know that's exactly what he did he you know he has a full-time job in the whole mantis 3d printer thing he just yeah. built his team and put it out there and they do it i i, I, I something mike said uh, reminded me of that conversation when we had him on there 
Yeah, he had a whole team, but yet he's not there during the day because he has a full time job. Full-time. Yeah. Yep, and he has like a, a connection with the our local college. The guy um I used to teach with just retired. He just built two of those uh printers for him. So he's working that was, time for him. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good episode. This is it right here. Uh he was cool. Um Joe Sinclair. And he's got this I I, I you know thankfully I I started the episode by saying, yeah, another 3d printer yeah great who cares right <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just a regular 3d printer the 3d printer is like it's great for for teachers because it doesn't you don't have to level the bed uh, there's better software so that you don't have to mess around is basically what's going on so that's why we interviewed him otherwise why would you care about another 3d printer it's like who cares but yeah he's a young guy he's got his own he's yeah. you know and then during the day, he's a engineer working in uh, CNC manufacturing. And then you're right; like he even had a president of the company, right, Matt? Pretty cool. I, I you know, and I wouldn't have known to do that. You know, I mean, it took me forever to hire my first, the first person that I, you know, for uh, for to help me teach the classes and the product I'm working on. I've got a college kid that used to be one of my students he's working with me as well but that was like i was so scared to do that i was like oh my god i'm gonna lose so much money no it's gonna work out you know so far with the welding classes it does work out really well and you know what sucks for us we've talked about this before ron is we don't get to hire any employees <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and i know we've all discussed this <laughs> yeah well I, it's so funny they got these grants come in and but you can never hire an assistant teacher and it would be great if you could because then they could overlap you and then maybe in the next five years or whatever that person could become a teacher and then when you, if you retire or whatever you're not taking the information with you you're leaving it behind and well, there's today, no today or yesterday my students are like why why won't they let you like hire another teacher blue me they're like you know how, how easy that how much because they they saw i got my ten thousand steps in today on the job site like i was doing my like Running, going to the back, checking on the guys, running to the front, crawling up on the scaffolding, checking on those guys. That like 10,000 steps on the job site today. So however many miles that is. And they're like, why? Why? Too bad they just won't let you hire another person. You know how nice it'd be if you had a second, per, like a second teacher out here? I'm like, yep, I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 100%. Uh, uh, it's amazing to me because, you know, it, it's one thing is like, okay, you're just starting out. But if you were a shop teacher for, I'm on year 17, but if you're on, if you're anything past 15, you're at the point where you're, you, you know, you, the day to day is not really where it's at. They're not getting their money's worth on the day to day. They really should get you to a higher position and not a supervisor. That's a different position, but like more like a, uh, they used to have a head teacher in the shop classes, but they got rid of that position. Anyway, it's a whole other, that's a whole other topic. Well, Anything else we got? I mean, this is awesome. I can't wait to go through this. That was a good question, Duke, about the episode to start with. Yeah, I'm going to check it out this week. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Let me know what you think. Yeah, I mean, you go through them in order because they definitely evolve. You know, I, I I was pretty – I'd say I was uncomfortable at the beginning of doing it because I'm speaking into the ether, and there was no feedback right away, you know? Just – me talking, long pauses. A friend of mine told me I was going to win an award um, for the best construction podcast, and I told her that I probably win an award for the most dramatic long pauses in any podcast. <laughs> so, so prepare yourself for that. But, um, but yeah, I, 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 I'd love to get some feedback from you guys on it. And this coming season is just going to be interviews, just me talking with people. Um, and Brant and I talked the other day and, and, uh, you know, it's a great lineup and then I'll start doing more topical stuff again in another season. I just, I'm, I'm buried in stuff to do right now. So, yeah, this is awesome. Well, I, you know, and what, what I could see happening is maybe this would inspire some of the shop teacher, uh, people on the, on the podcast here, maybe, uh, come up with a shop class podcast book. How to teach shop class? At least, at least, 
I was thinking there's two approaches you could do. Hey, this is year one. Like you're, you know, rookie shop teacher, emergency book, and then another book, and just call it the first fifteen years, and it's just a reflection, and we could put all our stories together or something, uh, you know, because it, it it'd be like hard to, you know, it's like exactly like a house in Alaska versus a house in Florida, just like this shop class in New Jersey is totally different from a shop class, even in West Jersey, you know, <laughs> so it's like, you, you could also, you could also frame the book in a sense that, you know, a dad could take the book and use it for his son or daughter because there's not shop classes everywhere anymore, you know? So it could be for teachers or just someone who wants to teach their kids. You're hundred percent right. And you know what? And then you, got, then you got a huge audience. Yes. Endless. And you know, yeah. uh, you're hundred percent right. The, there is a book out called shop class as soul craft, which probably people in here have read. The problem with that book is it is like a psychological warfare. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the guy is, you can feel him like fighting with the psychologists of why people don't have shop class in it. Forget it. Forget it. Just give us the technique. Give us, what do you recommend? <laughs> like mm. you're having, a, the guy's basically having an argument with the people that already cut the shop classes and already retired to Florida. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is gone. What are we going to do about the new? You know, and I, I'm not putting the book down because it's pretty cool that he did that, but sort of unnecessary, right? Right? Yeah. Dude? the the right. uh, the uh, The title is definitely deceiving. I bought the book. I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be awesome." Then I'm reading it, and I'm like, Shh. "Lucky there's a lot of stories about motorcycles to keep me interested." But uh, like you said, it was definitely like, you know, a struggle he was going through, and. It wasn't what the title. <laughs> it wasn't what the title was, really. No, and and everyone recommends it. You know, shop class yeah. is soul craft. This is an important book. Yeah, yeah, it's important. But what about what do we do about shop teachers coming up and contractors coming up? And what do you do about the father son or mother daughter at home that want to work on something? You know, that's more important than having a war with a with a with someone from the 90s that cut the shop class like okay they cut the shop class that's it they did something that you know bad for society okay but that's the past you know nothing we well, can do about that we, we may have an opportunity to start gathering these stories because here right right after christmas i'm gonna ask, start asking you guys um kind of these questions because um supposed to be getting together with some industry leaders to start talking about how to bring all this back so we, we, we may have a starter we may have a starter pack to this <laughs> to the shop class podcast shop teacher book <laughs> all right all right drop <laughs> yeah and if you just put a bit a camera down the end of my hallway because i have these sixth graders coming up from the first Brain floor bucket. to the third floor they're sweating and huffing and puffing but they can't wait they can't wait you know, to put a tool in their hand and get working. And one day, you know, they came in, they're a little rowdy. And we just sat there. I just waited, I waited, I waited. I said, you guys can talk all you want. It's your time. You want to talk, you can talk. Or you want to work, you want to work. And then the next day they came in, phew, you didn't hear a peep out of them because they just wanted to go. Yeah. You know, I my, if I got paid a different way, I would define it as when you got those kids who then all of a sudden realize, uh, you know, something in their shop, and they go, "Oh, I can get paid on the oh like that," you know, like we we do penny batteries. The kids didn't realize that you got two different metals, and you can make a battery out of it. So we're gonna run a, a little LED light on pennies, just because one of them's got zinc in it and the other one has copper on the outside. It blows their minds, you know. So like. How can you not have that class? You know, how come that's an elective? You know what I mean? They've been, they've had physics and, and, and science that up until the point they come to my class, they've never applied anything. 
Mm-hmm. And what I always say, my old thing is that you could get somebody to read like an entire book. The book could be the size of a phone book about bicycles, the, everything, the pedal size, the, the, the handlebars. You could read that your whole life. But until you ride a bicycle, you will have no idea how to use a bicycle or how to fix a bicycle. Yeah. So, you know, th- there, there is merit to having the shop class. And that goes for everything they do. That There's no use in getting to, to memorize anything because they don't have to memorize anything anymore. They got their phone. So it's kind of silly. Uh, you need application, uh, you know, actually doing something, you know. But I'm preaching to the choir here, you know. So, all right, well, uh, that was pretty good. That's another awesome episode. Appreciate it. Mike, thanks for coming in. Hey, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. And uh, BloomQuest, dropping hints about the future. I think we got – this is a good group. This is such a fun thing. I, I look forward to every Wednesday. Um, we're going to have another uh, – I think next Wednesday – is next Wednesday – the before thanksgiving or is it all yeah. right so we're gonna yeah, skip yeah next Wednesday. Yeah. all right so we're gonna skip a week we're gonna skip a week so that's that's thanksgiving week and then we'll, we'll be back afterwards all right um and then we got to get this thing on to uh just some future stuff uh, we're gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna ask and ask around about getting it on to uh transferring all of it onto uh uh, a podcast platform. I think I'm already on Anchor, but I got to move all the video stuff over. Uh, and we're going to do some T-shirts and hats and whatnot coming up. So, all right. Well, this is good. Uh, uh, Jay, thanks for coming in. All right, Nick, as always. Matt, I love the progress on the house. It's so cool to see it. I'm just like blown away by the whole process. Duke, always in there with a good joke. I love it. He's, you know. <laughs> He's like the bartender among us. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Brant, Brant's always got the enthusiasm. It's so good. And Mike, I really appreciate you coming in. This is a good thing. I think you're doing great with these. I listened to your 16 highlighted, the 16 mm-hmm. highlights. That was cool. Uh, and I'm going to listen to all the episodes because it, it applies. It applies to uh, any any small small business entrepreneur. It definitely applies. So, all right, I'm going to end the recording here. Let's stop the recording. Thanks for joining us, Shop Class Podcast. See you soon. Take care, guys. Thanks.